<laughs> Put this team right here. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to meet, I am Heather Farrell. I'm curator and director of exhibitions at Burlington City Arts. And we are thrilled to have you join us for uh, today's virtual artist talk with Becky Davis and Jay Simple. Welcome, Jay and Becky. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Heather. And uh, we always like to give everyone um, a few minutes to arrive and, and sort of check in with our program. So before we officially begin, uh, I thought I'd check in and uh, see what's what's happening in the dark room, or as we were earlier, earlier speaking about, is there a dark room or is it all digital now? I'm kind of curious. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I teach out at uh, Longwood University, good old Farmville. I teach photo out there. Yeah, like we were talking about, like, I think, I mean, still we do both like the dark room for like introductory stuff. But I mean, now it's like really weird because it's really hard to find the gear and equipment in a weird way. Like a lot of the cameras and stuff that you go get like your grandfather's camera, like starting to realize that my generation took up a lot of those cameras. <laughs> so like people who are coming and trying to find those, uh, <laughs> we've either coveted them or probably like broke them or something. Um, so I don't know, it's interesting. I have a feeling that it'll eventually phase out, but um, I know that's probably like for super photo people, like blasphemous. It, there is a small part in me that's slowly dying with that news. <laughs> but since I studied that decades ago, it, yeah. it sounds like it's going the way of 19th century photography, right. you know? Yeah, it's an inevitability, right? And then what's gonna be crazy is like your intro course will be digital and then your advanced course will be like iPhone photography. That's probably gonna really hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jay. We're going to have to have you back for another uh, talk. <laughs> and, how, and how about you, Becky? Like, what have you been up to? Oh, um, I've been teaching foundations. So, and trying to figure out how to do that um, over Zoom. <laughs> oh, my so, gosh. Yeah. That, is, that is a big challenge. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Well, we're, we're thrilled and to have you both here and... You know, I think we've had a few minutes that we can like launch into the program. And uh, the nice thing, uh, Becky and Jay, is that uh, with these virtual artist talks, we always like to record them. And so it could be, you know, mandatory uh, homework assignment or something like that later. Ooh. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> creating those materials uh, and we've only been doing these uh, I, I think for like maybe six months um, but it's been really interesting that despite the challenges and the lost opportunity to meet you both in person um, which I'm sorry to miss out on that that aspect of it we've really um, enjoyed having a, a larger reach in the community so with that I'd like to welcome everyone and for those who might have joined late I'm Heather Farrell. I'm the curator and director of exhibitions here at Burlington City Arts BCA Center in Vermont. And thank you for joining us for our artist talk with Becky Davis and Jay Simple. Artists who often use images from the past to comment on and critique contemporary culture. Becky's work in the shadow of Dixie is currently featured in BCA's exhibit, Unprecedented. And she's invited fellow artist Jay Simple to join our conversation today, where they will discuss their thoughts on working with archival documents and imagery, as well as the intersection of art and activism, and present an overview of their respective practices. So again, welcome both of you. And welcome, welcome. And before we begin, though, I'd like to share uh, a few notes on today's program for our audience in the sense of after my introductions for Becky and Jay, um, our artists will give an overview of their respective work, and then they'll uh, share separate presentations before beginning a conversation about the advantages, limitations, and the responsibilities of working with archives. And this is a really rich topic that's been especially interesting um, to see developed here uh, the last few weeks um, as, as we've been dialoguing, so thank you. And I'm very interested how it all ties into activism in the audience. And then following both of your conversation, we will open up the program to questions from our virtual audience, um, which I will help moderate with the artists. 
So the pr overall presentation will be about 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll turn it over to always some great dialogue that happens at the end of these virtual artist talks. And for those of you who are interested, we appreciate questions from our participants. Please use your Zoom Q&A feature to pose your question for Becky and Jay, and then we'll answer, answer at the end. And there's also a chat feature if you wanna share a comment. And then a final reminder is that today's webinar will be recorded and posted on our BCA Home Studio site. So let us begin with some bios. Uh, currently featured in our exhibit Unprecedented, Becky Davis is an interdisciplinary artist from Fort Benning, Georgia, and currently resides in Wakefield, Rhode Island. Davis's work explores the relationship between history, monument, and the relationship between African American experience and performance art. Becky holds a BFA from Columbus State University, Georgia, and an MFA from Lesley University, Massachusetts. Her work has been exhibited at the Photographic Museum of Humanity in Herrick Gallery in Rhode Island, the St. Boltoff Club Foundation in Massachusetts, and the Vermont Center for Photography in Brattleboro. Most recently, she was the recipient of the 2019 City of Providence Department of Art, Culture, and Tourism Project Sun Grant. She was co-curator of Unpolished Legacies in Providence and the guest curator of Will Work for Revolution at RISD Museum, Rhode Island. Jay Simple is a visual artist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and works through photography and a variety of media. Jay examines historical and contemporary effects of colonialism and white-centric ideology within the context of the United States. Jay holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography from Columbia College, Chicago, a Master of Liberal Art from the University of Pennsylvania, and a Master of Fine Arts in Photography from Rhode Island School of Design. Jay's recent solo exhibitions include Hebden Cindy College in 2019 and group exhibitions at Jamestown Art Center and Longwind, excuse me, Longwind Center for Visual Arts in 2020. Jay is also a 2020 artist in residency at the Philadelphia Photo Art Center and co-curator of Asterix in the Grand Narrative of History at the Longwood Center for Visual Arts, which just opened on January 15th. Currently, he is visiting assistant professor of photography at Longwood University, Virginia, and founder of the Photographer's Green Book, a resource for inclusion, equity, and diversity within the photographic medium. Thank you, Becky and Jay, for joining us today. We are so happy to have such prominent artists here in our community. And with that, I'd love to turn the time over to you. Thank you so much for having us, Heather. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, thank you also to the Burlington City Arts uh, Center. Um, um, it's been wonderful to, to be in Unprecedented over the past few months. Uh, I was delighted for the opportunity to share my work with the community. Um, um, I wish I could be there in person. <laughs> um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and while I do that, I also wanna thank uh, everyone who's joining us today uh, via Zoom. Um, I appreciate you uh, sharing virtual space with us. Okay. Okay, so um, I wanted to start uh, kind of at the beginning uh, to give you a little bit of context uh, about um, where I'm coming from, where I come from um, and how the work is uh, situated. So one of my very first memories of um, going on a school trip, uh, a field trip, was to the Cyclorama in Atlanta, Georgia. So the Cyclorama is one of the largest paintings in the world. It's a 360 degree painting depicting the Battle of Atlanta. So um, my second grade uh, class took um, all of the students up to Atlanta, which at the time I lived in Columbus, so it was about an hour and a half drive uh, for us to experience this um, painting that's presented as like a, like a cinematic experience. So um, you enter in the dark, you sit in a theater, um, everything's darkened and the lights come up and this enormous painting with um, an expanded universe of a, of a diorama um, is a full scale diorama um, is uh, revealed. And um, it was an incredible experience for me um, because 
it was one of the first times I truly remember feeling uncomfortable and feeling like I was in a situation that wasn't meant for me or I was witnessing um, a history that wasn't meant for me and didn't include me. Um, so this image uh, is one of the, um, it's an image that I took with my very first camera. We were just talking about film cameras. Um, this image is taken at a, um, a Pathfinder uh, parade. So the Pathfinders is kind of um, a group um, based on uh, the, the scouts. Um, and it's specific to the Seventh-day Adventist church, the church that I grew up in. Um, so in the background, you can see three flags, um, which are really indicative of sort of my childhood. Um, the American flag, uh, what was then the Georgia state flag um, that has the Confederate battle flag um, uh, symbol on it, and the Christian flag. So um, in 2017, I was coming off of uh, doing a series, a series of work titled um, whose name was written water. It was an experimental documentary. Um, this experimental documentary uh, talked about my relationship to one of my ancestors, uh, Charity Ann, who was enslaved on a farm in Georgia, about 40 miles from where I grew up. Um, one of the things that I found um, doing the research of, uh, for that project uh, was that the literal center, the literal heart of the um, rural community where she lived um, and was enslaved uh, was a Confederate monument. It was steps away from a courthouse that continues to house the records um, uh, proving and, and documenting her enslavement. So I started, because of that project, I started thinking a lot about monuments and what they mean and um, how they affect us even without really, you know, without us being aware that they affect us. Um, I ran across this uh, quote in my readings, thus monuments are lasting incentives to those who view them to imitate the virtues they commemorate and to attain by their life and spirit, glory and honor. So I ran across this text um, in a, a book called The Necessity for Ruins by J.B. Jackson. Um, doing that work gave me the idea to sort of go back to Georgia um, and confront uh, Confederate monuments in all of the towns that I lived in. Uh, I was a military brat and I lived in several um, cities across the state, eight in fact. Um, and every single city has a Confederate monument in a highly conspicuous public space. So um, the first city was Atlanta, or sorry, the first city was Athens, uh, shown here. Um, and the monument in Athens um, is situated right at the intersection of downtown and the campus to the University of Georgia. So the um, this road trip or this going back to confront these statues included a couple of things. Documenting the space, so um, taking a series of photographs of the monument and the surrounding um, environment. Um, sitting in the shadow of uh, the monument and writing a series of postcards. In Georgia, it um, is illegal to remove uh, Confederate monuments or conceal them in any way. Um, so I wrote these postcards to appeal to uh, politicians that had jurisdiction over the, each space. Um, so I want to acknowledge here that um, I couldn't have done this project without the support of Jacques Bidon, um, who uh, was the offset printer, um, uh, the master offset printer at AS220 here in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, and also uh, second camera operators, uh, Noel Akarika and Gavino Pujoni. Um, here I also list all eight cities uh, that uh, we visited over the course of uh, this 32 hour performance. So um, the documentation of uh, these interventions um, became a multimedia installation um, as seen here. Uh, this is the uh, installation that's on view now at um, 
uh, Burlington City Arts. Uh, so the idea behind this, um, this multimedia uh, installation is that not only do I wanna present documentation of the performances, but I also feel the, the need or I wanna say the responsibility of sharing the information um, and the research that I found in doing this project. Uh, so I wanted to share here a quote uh, from uh, Romancing the Shadow. Uh, it's in the new uh, RISD Museum Manual, issue 14, Shadows, and it's written by um, uh, scholar, curator, uh, Anita Bateman. When Toni Morrison writes of ripping the veil in her essay, The Side of Memory, she conveys it as a necessity of breaching and an invitation to Black people to own their own narratives, to transform terrible histories, dangerous even, into power. Uh, one of the, the cornerstones of this installation is this um, infographic by, uh, published by the Southern Poverty Law Center that um, basically shows in a single graph uh, the correlation between the, um, the installation or, or the construction of these Confederate monuments and public sites of commemoration um, for the uh, Confederacy with um, uh, white supremacist uh, terrorist movements like uh, the, the Klan. Uh, so this, uh, another thing that this installation does is sort of highlights the, the role that nostalgia plays in these monuments. Um, and uh, one of the ways it does that is by highlighting the connection between uh, these postcards and uh, this romanticizing these sites in a way. Uh, the structure featured here in this postcard is the uh, slave market in Louisville, Georgia, where I graduated from high school. This is what the slave market looks like now. Um, as you can see, it's covered with uh, Christmas lights. So this installation um, includes uh, images that I took during that initial um, performance and also um, uh, historical or contextual information. Um, all of this context these contextual plaques uh, I wrote myself. Um, they also uh, feature original postcards. Uh, I designed these postcards specifically for uh, the interventions um, and facsimiles of all of the postcards that were written to uh, politicians. So um, the old market house, uh, this is the uh, official Georgia website for um, tourism. Uh, and it features this little blurb saying that recent research um, cast doubt on the fact that this was an actual slave market and that it may have just been a, a regular old market, right? So it took a two hour uh, Google search to find, uh, for me uh, on my own, to find a, an advertisement um, linking the sale of human beings uh, under the, the shadow of this mon, uh, structure. Uh, last year, well, not last year, um, in 2019, um, a year after this performance series, uh, Governor Kemp signed a bill uh, protecting Confederate monuments, um, but that uh, did not stop the monuments in some cases from coming down over the summer, thanks to the efforts of uh, local uh, activists and politicians. So um, I wanted to share the, these next few images because uh, uh, Jay and I have been friends for a while. I met Jay uh, when he was living here in Providence and attending uh, RISD. Uh, and over the summer, um, we, well, at, at the end of the summer, we decided, 
or we started collaborating on sort of um, a uh, photographic conversation, um, trying to capture the moment and what we were thinking. Um, this conversation is featured on a photo blog titled A New Nothing. Uh, and this is how it started. <laughs> um, him sharing an image of Huey Newton and me sharing an image of Mary Fields. Um, it went on to uh, involve sort of us connecting um, site and place uh, and um, how we navigate those sites and, and spaces. Uh, there's also quite a, uh, a lot of moving fluidly between um, like our own original photography and sort of mining the archives to comment um, on what's happening, what's going on, what's thinking, um, how or what we're thinking, how we're feeling. Um, and it's been one of the highlights of my year and it's with um, great joy and excitement um, that I'm sitting here in conversation with Jay uh, and I'm happy to introduce you. Thank you, Becky. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here with you and everyone. Um, yeah, that new nothing thing has been a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's kind of playful, but then also just sort of kind of interesting to be able to uh, like source through all these like different imagery that we kind of come across and like these similarities that are occurring or these kind of, you know, interesting interconnections. Um, so we've been doing that for a while now and and currently Becky has me stumped. So I need to, it's like every time we talk about it, I'm always like, ah, oh, crap, I need to get on there. I need to find something to like, <laughs> I feel like it's like a slight competition, but not really, but it's like <laughs> trying to, uh, to be clever in sort of like this photographic way. Um, so today I was going to, well, I will uh, share a little bit of uh, my current project that I'm working on that kind of culminates together, I think, a lot of the ways that I've been thinking about photo and my practice. So we'll see if I do this correctly. Okay. I'll get it right. There we go. Awesome. Perfect. Um, so currently I've been working on a project titled Exodus Home. Um, and in this project, I'm kind of concerned with uh, the great migration, uh, really looking at sort of this, you know, what, 60 or so year period between like, you know, 1917, 1916, I think until like, um, until about like the early seventies is considered sort of the two phases of the great migration where a lot of you know, black citizens um, are fleeing the South uh, from a lot of the racial prosecution and violence due to you know, Jim Crow and the KKK. Um, so originally I'm from Philadelphia, um, city of brotherly love, so they say. And I just recently moved out to uh, Southern Virginia. Um, and where I live at, there's a large amount of uh, still standing old, uh, either domestic or agricultural spaces that would have been around during the period of the Great Migration. Uh, this photograph right here is in the back of my house, right? So it's very much a part of my normal sort of um, iconography. And in this, I'm kind of interested in this uh, movement of people uh, during this period of time to escape violence. And I'm kind of trying to think about these cycles and these moments that happen. Um, and I'm using this with photography. And also I incorporate uh, sculpture and multimedia in different ways. Um, so in regards to like how I've been thinking about this in terms of like a cycle and what I mean by that. Um, so this is an image uh, originally from uh, the Red Summer in 1919. Um, and the Red Summer was uh, when a lot of African-Americans, right, went over and served in World War I. Uh, they came back uh, newly trained and also having seen uh, a different world as they traveled that wasn't as um, discriminatory as their own country was towards them. 
And when they returned, this had changed their outlook and their mindset about the world that they lived in. Um, and as they were returning, uh, white citizens and states did not like really this newfound sense of empowerment that black citizens had. And these resulted in many different uh, race riots and such. Uh, one of these was uh, coined the summer, the Red Summer, which occurred in 1919, where in several places from you know, Chicago to DC, uh, there were a series of riots, right? And so I'm interested in like, in these sort of moments that create uh, ways for us to think about how, um, you know, 1919s also during sort of the period of the great migration, thinking how all these sort of things uh, culminate to create a moment where people are feeling a need or a necessity to flee. When I think about that in terms of a cycle, um, I can come down to uh, present day moments and thinking about red summers. Um, so this is an image of the Minneapolis uh, precinct uh, burning uh, in May, like late May, uh, in response to the death of George Floyd, right? And so when I think about cycles, uh, I'm thinking about how there are, um, you know, people fled from the great migration to go to Northern cities and these metropolitans or what became metropolitans. And then now if we look at those period places, right, you can look at Philadelphia as an example as well. Uh, we see large amounts of violence and persecution against those great migrants descendants, right? And so when I'm thinking about moving and motion and migration and home, right, I'm trying to understand, you know, how is it that these spaces become um, places of violence when they were once seen as places of safety? And then how do we understand what a place of safety uh, where that might actually live and be at, right? So I'm kind of using this project as a space to um, look at what's a safe home and looking at that in comparison to what's old and what's new. Um, and just like this continued necessity of feeling like um, you're having to escape or run or get away or navigate in some way these, uh, these persecutions or violences that are put upon you. Right, and even thinking about the tools that are necessary for you to be able to uh, get through those spaces. Um, this is one of kind of my one of my favorites uh, for me personally, uh, just because I I have a weird sense of humor, perhaps. But uh, in this image, really thinking about uh, what we we what we carry with ourselves uh, to be able to navigate sort of these spaces, or what do we need if we're going on a migration, an exodus from a space, right, to look for for a new home, right? And so I think about, you know, having the hammer as like a, a, a symbolism of having to be able to build and to like, you know, construct some space for yourself, right? Thinking about Martin Luther King, right? And thinking about this idea of like community and nonviolence and love one another. Um, thinking about money and economy, right? Especially as we, uh, as we know, like somehow or another, um, as we're trying to navigate and find safe spaces, we often find ourselves in systems which don't really work for our benefit, uh, right? Capitalism has been one that hasn't really worked a lot for Black people. And even in the Great Migration, right, money and better opportunities was a part of it. But even so, that dollar or that $10 bill has that Confederate stamp on it, right? So even, even as they try to escape the ideologies and the ideas about them uh, still were carried on, even though to have that as a mode of trade or to support oneself was necessary. Um, and then there's the, the pistol, right? It's even kind of counter sort of this, this image of Martin Luther King to think about violence, to think about self-defense in terms of what uh, black people have done and had to do when migrating or finding themselves in those positions. And finally, of course, the good bottle of Hennessy for the good times as well as the bad times. And you know, through the project, I kind of rely on a lot of these different motifs. One of, of course, like you know, cars and travel and roads. Uh, the suitcase has been one um, with which I've been kind of working through uh, in different manners that sort of connect my current space with uh, with home um, in, in some different ways. Um, in one way, you know, uh, where I live in Farmville, Virginia. Uh, was visited by W.E.B. Du Bois during his time uh, researching and writing uh, the Philadelphia Negro. And he read about or heard about Farmville uh, through people that he was interviewing in Philadelphia uh, and found that there were many connections between the two spaces. And he went to Farmville 
and he did a short study of it as well. And so I kind of see Philadelphia and the sort of area uh, serendipitously, I didn't know that was a connection before I moved here, um, as like these two sort of linked spaces. And so in this piece, um, thinking about sort of that, that usage of the suitcase to symbolize uh, this kind of migration, um, and then inside of it, talking about and using images, uh, a lot of them archival, um, of the MOVE bombing, uh, which happened in May 13th, 1985, uh, when the Philadelphia police uh, dropped a bomb on the MOVE house on Osage Street. So it was a home that was being uh, used and occupied by um, you know, Black people who did not live their life as accustomed uh, to perhaps what uh, the society around them uh, wanted. And they were seen as a nuisance and they were bombed and they were killed. 11 people were killed uh, in this bombing, right? And so again, to think about what home is, right? It happens here to think about what occupation of a place can mean. Uh, one way is right, like these people were living here and uh, the police and the state thought of them as uh, unwanted occupants, right? Occupying the space that they needed to be moved from. On another end, the, the people who were occupying the space uh, saw the state and the government as uh, people who are trying to occupy their minds and their bodies to operate and think different ways, right? And so as we find ourselves migrating and moving right around, uh, we often see these sort of button up against ideals of you know who gets to call what home and who gets to decide what you can and can't do within that space. So using again, a lot of archival uh, imagery that really trying to connect a lot about the space that I'm particularly in. Um, kind of interesting part, Farmville was a part of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, when they decided to uh, desegregate schools, Farmville instead, uh, Prince Edward County, instead of um, opening up the public schools, they shut them down for five years, which has a lasting effect on people's perception and understanding of education. Um, and so I kind of wanted to make this school seat that would seem both hazardous, but also told this history of like struggle to be able to use that chair, right? And that sort of hazardous situations that people would find themselves in, uh, trying to achieve a sense of education, right? For some reason, this really like speaks to me, like even, even post, right? Brown versus Board of Education, like thinking of, of educational spaces now um, within, within the scope of trying to operate being black or being other than, than white within those spaces can often be very much hazardous. And a lot of the, the work is sort of performative as well. Um, a lot of it's really about uh, giving spaces to think about, you know, where my body fits in these landscapes, just as I'm trying to figure it out probably right now, right? Like in the real world of where I fit at, where I can be uh, comfortable at. Um, and so a lot of the images are of me exploring, of me like appearing to like fix or engage with the landscape and the spaces. Um, they're very much often um, dilapidated and being, you know, falling apart. Um, I often think um, long-term, like it'll be interesting to look at this work, maybe like, I don't know, 20, 30 years when some of these spaces are no longer around. And to think about again, right? Like how do you then understand my own relationship to that space if I don't have this like marker, right? Um, and then all of these, uh, all this, the photographs and everything sort of come together in uh, these installations where I'm pulling a lot of the objects from the spaces. So I'll shoot at like these barns and I will, tear down the barn. I'll take that down like the siding of the barn, use those as a framing for the wood. Uh, as I'm going through these spaces, um, a lot of them still have objects and things that people use in those homes, right? And so I'm collecting those objects as well. And it becomes sort of this like more tactile sort of feeling of uh, the space and of the content to try to create this environment where you're more enveloped in sort of this moment of both past and present sort of like conflating together to ask you, and to think about, you know, what do you think about home and how do you make sense of where you live or where you want to live? Um, outside of my creative practice, I've been uh, 
one thing I've been working on is the, the Photographer's Green Book, which is a directory uh, that has a lot of stuff about inclusion, diversity, equity, and advocacy in the arts and photography, the medium of my, my heart's desire, right? Um, and in it, you know, I really kind of dive into some of the issues that I have with uh, photography as a medium, which can be uh, increased, I guess not increasingly, has always been a very Eurocentric view of what that medium can be and who is accepted in it. And so it was a possibility or a way for me to uh, create community and resources for uh, those spaces that aren't that, right? And so it's a listing of organizations right now, like over 140, I think, organizations that uh, support or are run by BIPOC or LGBTQ uh, individuals. Um, and we have different type of resources. One of the most recent ones is uh, this um, listing of all the academic letters, not all, but a lot of academic letters that we sourced uh, where faculty, administration, or students were asking for an increase in diversity at universities. And it's uh, sort of just really about bringing all those informations together. So we have a listing of like over 20 of those letters that people can surf through. And then that information is distilled through these charts and this like kind of academic talk-esque, um, which is supposed to be sort of uh, satire in a way uh, with how uh, all these universities are creating like these committees and they have to like quantify the experiences of black people or other people who don't see themselves reflected in that university to have them somehow or another then uh, give uh, purpose or give validation for those people's experiences. Um, also uh, in good old Farmville at the Longwood Center for Visual Arts, uh, me and one of my colleagues, uh, Emma Steinhardt, just opened Asterix in the Grand Narrative of History, which is an exhibition that, uh, that shows the work of eight amazing, wonderful, generous, creative, talented, God, I, I need better words because I think they you know the work they're they're really making is 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 amazing. All using archive um, and thinking about how the past uh, influences uh, intersects with the present and all these amazing things. Uh, which of course Becky Davis uh, graced us with uh, her shadow in the shadow of Dixie uh, piece, um, which was a wonderful. Um, it was wonderful for me to be able to like sit there and sort of look at it. I remember, I think, I think when you were going to Georgia to do some of the work, we were talking um, about it. So it's been nice to be able to see like it all sort of come to fruition and to see some of the new work that you're working at with and sort of this like long term conversation that you are you're having with uh, your practice and with these like spaces, right? Um, and so to kind of transition maybe a little bit to uh, conversation, I had a question uh, for you, Becky, because um, as you were talking um, about some of the new laws that were getting passed about like defending these spaces, but then also all of these new things are, have happened with some of the monuments going down. I just wonder like, what are some of the ways that how you viewed the work may have changed or been impacted by some of this more recent uh, more recent things. Thank you so much, Jay, for sharing your work um, and uh, also for the great question. So, um, so many things uh, have happened since starting that work. Uh, one was, as I mentioned, um, in 2019, the law, the existing law that that protected those monuments was reinforced, which was like a huge blow. And then this year, the monument, or well, 2020, because time is an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> um, many of the monuments came down. Three of them are either already down or on their way. Um, it's been incredible. And I'm so grateful to the local um, activists and um, local politicians like like uh, city and county politicians who made that happen. Um, the 2019 uh, the 2019 law that um, 
supported those monuments, um, stripped local governments of the ability to make decisions over what happened in their space and in their communities. Um, but uh, some of them lawyered up <laughs> in the meantime, you know, they, they're like, okay, well, we'll do this now, but they lawyered up and found ways around the law because the law is still in place. Mm -hmm. um, so how does my relationship to the work change? I think that it's still important because many of these monuments still exist. There are literally thousands of Confederate monuments across the United States. Um, and the purpose of this project, I think from the very beginning was to, well, from the very beginning first, it was to sort of try to heal my relationship to these places, mm -hmm. um, but it's become educating others about the histories behind these structures, what they really mean, why they're in these specific locations um, and how toxic they are uh, to local communities um, so that folks can make up their own minds about whether or not they should stay. Definitely. Um, which, which, which makes me think of a, can I ask one follow up? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, it kind of makes me think because we were we had been talking uh, a few weeks ago. I think we were talking about um, sort of this like the impact of like sort of work and when we make work, right? Um, right. And so I, I just I wonder, right? Like while these things are coming down, everything are you like are you like in the back of your mind, like looking at the shadow of Dixie and be like, I did it, right? Like you know what I mean? Like do you feel like your work? <laughs> no, but I, I'm joking. But like right? Like do you you feel your work, right? And we're we're talking about these ideas of like activism and using sort of our artistic form. Do you see your work having uh, impacted that? And if not, like what is what is for you the impact of the work? I don't really see my work as having, you know, any sort of. Um, any sort of impact on you know what's happening there right now. Um, I see and have always seen the work as, so I feel sort of this disconnection from the place, but also, you know, it's a, a space uh, like Georgia is, my whole family's still there. I still visit, well, before COVID, like pre-COVID, I visited every year. Um, I still have friends there. So, it was, it filled a need to reconnect myself with this space, but also, you know, like think of, like insert myself into the conversation, I guess. I wanted to be, I wanted to become part of the conversation. Um, and then I realized that it was kind of, it was less about being part of the conversation and more about sharing information with others. Um, and, and so, you know, if it's had any sort of impact, I think that impact was less like in the state itself, but more um, educating others uh, about what's happening um, and what has happened. Like, you know, uh, the history of these monuments, I grew up my entire life <laughs> um, surrounded by these structures and had no idea who created them, why they were there. Um, what they were meant to do and learning those things was just, I mean, it was, I can't even say heartbreaking. It was just infuriating, like learning the very direct and implicit, like uh, relationship to white supremacy is you know, really gross. <laughs> I think but, that, oh that yeah, yeah. You have Go in ahead. there, right? Where it's like, it's like the sixties and like 1910 are like these big marks, but like when you, first think those those monuments and before you do the research you just think like oh like these were these were like during the the civil war or something like that yeah like <laughs> during right after the civil war yeah but no they were like when the clan was established when um birth of a nation uh was released <laughs> um like when um gone with the wind was uh coming out like these were the benchmarks for you know when these things went up like yeah, it, it's crazy. Yeah. I, I, that's a great question. And I wanted to follow up uh, with a question of my own with you about um, one of the things that I respect so much about your work is how you directly um, 
engage with building community and like you see a need and you fill it like uh, what you did with um, the photographer's green book. Um, can you talk a little bit about the conditions or like how you, um, how you came up with that idea and maybe where you see it going? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like the, I mean, what it has become definitely wasn't even, to be honest with you, close to what the original intention was, right? And that, right. that's totally fine. I think that's a good thing. I think when I, when I first started it was, um, you know, early last year or maybe, I don't know, like April, May-ish. Um, and it really came from uh, one, having a lot of inside time to sit down, right? Better or worse, right? Sit down and really think about the things that were going on, especially uh, with my career and sort of the field and the spaces that I kind of operate in. Um, and then simultaneously, right? We have um, all of these moments that are occurring again, if we look through history, right? Again, where we're ringing up uh, the social and racial inequalities that occur uh, in our country. And we're hearing a lot of people um, in this moment say, hey, we, we woke up and we, we see the wrongs of, of what our institutions have been doing and we wanna change something from that. Right. Um, and in that moment, right, uh, in, in the arts, you know, particularly um, as, as it connects to the Green Book, uh, a lot of places are starting to, you know, show black work or, uh, you know, offer or ask for the labor of black artists to come in to help them sort of uh, have a conversation around these uh, topics. And um, from that, I began to think about how much um, precedence is put in these organizations and institutions which generally don't accept us within them and how there are a lot of organizations and institutions that do, right? But still these other ones become like the cultural, like big ones, right? Like, so um, I was interested in, in, in creating sort of a community to bring all these other spaces together. Cause I know, you know, coming up that it has been uh, difficult to be able to uh, piece together where all the different people are, uh, yeah. mostly because we're, we tend to be spread out, right? Uh, that's sort of a, a side effect of uh, the system that we've operated in that to have a community and close knit is, is something that has to be laboriously done. And so I wanted to kind of combine uh, my ability to do some research and try to find organizations that were BIPOC run or, you know, who were allies for uh, what we were trying to, to experience or to talk about, which is our experience in lives, right? Yeah. Um, so that was like the impetus, um, impetus for it. And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting because like, right, even thinking about like cause or like activism and stuff, like, I oh, mean, it doesn't really even feel like activism, even that, like, and I think mostly just because um, the activism is really what everyone else is doing. And I think that what we're trying to do is just create uh, just a hub where we can all kind of like meet together to be able to talk about things. So, I mean, the future where it's headed uh, right now, which is kind of cool is we're gonna be, uh, we partnered together with uh, Philadelphia Photo Art Center um, and we'll be teaching um, classes with high school students about um, putting together their own zines for how to navigate their communities or their neighborhoods. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I think that's like, I think that that one was like, oh, oh, wow, like we can really kind of get into it, right? Because I mean, yeah. I love, I love these conversations and I love this, right? But um, to enter into this space is a very particular set of <laughs> other things that occurred, right? Um, and, and so I want to be able to have these kind of conversations with, you know, kids who might be interested in becoming artists or going to college who are going to have to uh, learn how to navigate these spaces, right? And so how can we get them to already start thinking about that where they are so they can bring it over uh, wherever they might go in the future? Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I can't wait to follow. <laughs> Me too. I, I I have to finish up the syllabus. So me. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited though. So um, a couple of things from your talk like really resonated with me. Um, one was sort of the aesthetics of protest, right? Like I think for you, um, it shows up a lot in um, the protest signs um, and posters uh, and. For me, I think that it's more 
Um, I'm gonna say gendered for a very specific reason. So like in my research, I found that a lot of these monuments were founded, actually almost all of them were um, founded by women's groups, um, groups of uh, wealthy um, women of a, uh, white women of a certain class who would organize and throw parties in their living rooms, um, you know, entertain and have people over. They would write lots of letters and they would fundraise to, to create these structures. Um, these groups of women were also the same uh, groups of women who were, um, who lobbied to get uh, books changed in the uh, educational system um, that would look favorably on the Confederacy, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the choice of me to use postcards and to appeal through like letter writing um, and uh, like grassroots sort of um, methods and using that aesthetic in, in the shadow of Dixie was like a really intentional choice, right? So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, how you get to, uh, how you use uh, the, the aesthetics of politics um, and, and your choice around which images will work in that way. Yeah. I mean, I want a kite because it's in my head now. So I, I yeah. have to go ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to I'll try it. But, but it just makes me think about like the aesthetics of protest, right? And like, like yeah, I don't I'm like totally right. Like there's all these like different subsections of how certain people. Uh, historically have or can protest. And I think that like, I just, just to get out there, like right now, man, whew, like if this is not one of the moments of like realizing all of those things and how like thinking about protests and thinking about how we like uh, butt up against the issues that we find, we're, we're, we, if we didn't know already, which I think many people did, we're realizing uh, how those aesthetics are very much different for each person and what type of response each aesthetic gets because it's put upon a certain people to have to do it that way right right and so like for example we live in uh we live in the united states a, a culture of, of 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 violence whether we like it or not right and this was a colony that was built on genocide right it was a you know place that every historical large moment of movement has caused been a part of, of mass violence right but that has been the language of uh, the oppressor or the, you know, that has been the language of, of Eurocentric ideology that, you know, when they want to change something, they can exert that level of violence and it, it's normalized, right? Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, the aesthetic of, of protest uh, for, you know, Black people in this country has, has been about, you know, uh, litigation, about, you know, uh, governmental change or peaceful protest uh, in, in lieu of or like against right, uh, right the violence of whiteness and we can see that right now right with the the capital protests and the difference between the black lives matter protests right and um sort of the storming of the capital uh where all these people uh you, you see just clearly this instinctual um difference in it so i think that um in my work i think there is um i think there is a, a undertone of like using using a lot of those symbols of, of violence to show both like the the horror of sort of these institutions and what they do but i think like i often even rely back on uh embodying and like okay myself to uh to be violent in a weird way right to be because i think that that's like taught as like a way that you can't operate. And I'm not saying that that's the an answer, but I'm saying that there are, uh, uh, there, there's some type of saying where it's like, you know, I, I, I'm not for peace, I'm not for war, I'm, I'm for my freedom, right? And I would like to get it whichever way possible, like those means and everything, we can debate them to the end, but they're all possibilities. And we need to think about those and exactly uh, what they mean for how we sort of operate, right? But I like, but in a lot of ways though, yeah, I'm, I am referencing all those like different moments of protest, right? Whether it be, um, you know, I have one piece where it's a, a poster from um, like a KKK clan white supremacist poster and like taking those and like 
rewording the word. So instead of it talking about violence against other people, it reverts back to like violence against like white people or the people who would be giving out that poster, right? So to like right. circumvent that thing or to like put photographs on like, right, the protest like signs, right? And they can become these like symbols of protest for whatever they kind of like depict. Um, mm. yeah. I love that. So almost like, so, so like you're, subverting the the language of the oppressor and using it to um, create a, an entirely different message. Yeah, I think so. I hope so. I mean, those are the questions, right? Like those, <laughs> those are always the hope, right? Like <laughs> doing the thing. You use the, what is it, the master's tools to, to take down- to tear down the master's yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can just go even go back to just photography, right? And like all these histories that are with it. Like I really loved, um, in the Shadow Dixie where you're using the postcards. You know what I mean? And like, because I think I've, I've been doing a lot of thrifting, Becky. It's becoming a little bit of a problem. I, I know that like. I, I you know, <laughs> understand, right? But yeah. going to all these places, right? You start to see uh, the history of like different iconographies and what that that tool was used for, right? right? And and even in that, you can start to, to try to act like, like, or think about that like, even the act of using visual mediums within this space is like, it's an act of protest. It's an act of, right? Um, right. So yeah. I wonder too though, like, um, cause you were, we were talking about like activism and things. You were talking about how like the work that you make is not active, like that type of activism. But I wonder, do you see um, the work that you create as a form of activism within the arts though? like within sort of the field that you work in? Um, I think in a certain way, I don't know, it's hard to exist in any space in this country without it being like a political act, right? I mean, we've, we've talked about this a lot. Like I can just go out on the street in a certain place. <laughs> And, you know, that itself is um, an act of, of, of protest or activism. So I think, yes, um, creating a space where, or trying to like walk the line where I'm creating um, a work of art, but it's also functioning as an educational tool. Um, for like a very specific purpose. Uh, and I, I mean, I don't even always know like uh, if it's going to be you, you, the art fact can sometimes come secondary to this, like I have this message that I need to get out fact, right? Uh, and so that can be like a tough, a tough line to, to walk. Um, I, I don't know, what, what do you think about you and your, your practice? in regards to direct activism, like through the, the medium of photography and I really want it to be, <laughs> for whatever <laughs> right? that's worth, like I really, I really want it to be, like I, I, like the romantic in me really wants that, that to be a possibility. I think yeah. maybe it's because I, I'm a visual talker and so I, I want my language to be the language of change, right? <laughs> right. That was so good, but I think, I think when I, I think about my work, I think, yeah, I think of it as a, a, a way of like edu ed education, yeah, like in a way, right? Like to be able to bring these ideas and thoughts forward. But then like, there's this other thing like of like capturing sort of like the emotion or the feel of like this moment, right? And to be able right. to transmit that. I think, I kind of think of it like, um, yeah, it's not like the, it's not the boots on the ground, but it's sort of like, it can be like the drumbeat, right? Like it's the right. culture, it's the understanding of what we're doing, I love that. How, we, how we kind of do it. I kind of see, and even with, even using like the archive too, right? It's like yeah. uh, this cool way of, um, of, of like, like really like griot style, like, like uh, history telling or like that, that sort of, beat of the drum sort of analogy because like griots used to tell like they talk about somebody like no you you like 
you're getting the whole history. Like you're getting mama's, 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 mom. Like you're getting everybody. <laughs> right. That's what that's what really working in the archive kind of does is that you can uh, work your way through time from past to present to this moment. And you're putting all those things in contextualization uh, for people to come and they can they can work through past, present, right? All these things simultaneously and have like that emotional response, right? I hope that can like, can jazz someone up to be able to like, continue on whatever whatever journey that they might be on um yeah mm, that's great i so a couple of things um <laughs> one is that uh your collages that like the new work that you're doing really does that so well like you're you're putting these like contemporary photographs next to these archival like historical photographs and through like the use of paint and gold leaf you're almost collapsing time so I'm not sure you know what happened when um but I can tell that the gestures um the figures the tension is the same mm -hmm. yeah definitely and kind of really interesting too like this is sort of I'm still working out the language to talk about it, but in, in making that work, I was really interested in like this. Uh, I think some of it came from a lot of the conversations about like the politics, like protest photography and just made me kind of like think about it more recently, but like um, golding out everyone's like figures or bodies or face. So they're like, like in, in this way that is like, I don't know, like their actions or stuff, like can't really truly be understood if we like only look at like on skin value. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the implications of of what you know black people have been doing in this country has been to try to lift right our understanding of of humanity, right? right. Of making us more compassionate, of more ethical. Um, that has been the, at the root of it. The work that. Is being done but if we look at it surface value right we always associate it right back uh to these notions of race of like that person's identity but um really you know anyone fighting oppression anywhere is fighting oppression like everywhere to like right take a spin off of that yeah yeah i one of the things that really sort of resonated with me back over the the summer um was oh my gosh and i can't I hate that I'm not going to be able to cite this, um, but I, you know, was reading um, that we can't all be warriors, right? Some of us have the role of storytellers. Mm -hmm. um, some of us have the role as caregivers. Some of us are healers. Um, and I think that that's, you know, like where your work fits in, like, Yes, you are an activist. <laughs> um, and you're, you're also like through, you, you're an activist through your storytelling and through your ability to connect um, your body through like uh, to these spaces and talk about time in a way that, you know, really gets to the crux of the matter. These like, like you say, like repeating cycles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so. I try to. <laughs> yeah, always, for sure. Always, you know, it's <laughs> always like, right, and then at the end of the day, they're like these big, like general, like terminologies that we try to like somehow or another siphon ourselves into. Like, you know, to be an activist means this, or to be a historian, or to be an artist. Um, I think maybe, maybe this time we like get rid of of some of like the purity of those right like yeah right like yeah well, of course we're we're acting you're you're literally writing letters <laughs> to, <laughs> to these people like yes that's active like that is that is literally the act of activism right um but then there's like these other components of it so maybe it's not necessarily that we're not activists or we're like but i think that that as an artist i think part of it is like picking right like we we right. get to like we have like this level of freedom to be able to have what we want to grab on we can grab on all these different elements to be able to communicate a feeling right i mean like right writing those letters like sitting inside of the shadow that like, that's like both an intervention right and this like symbolic gesture that can occur but like to understand that you wrote those letters in the shadow of the the monuments peppers our understanding and reading of 
of that letter and what happened and what does it mean, right? Uh, I think that is like, that's the thing that kind of crosses over into like, I think that that other space where it's really about, um, you know, sitting down and, and contemplating the moment more so than like getting out and doing an action, right? Like I think activism often feels like we are protesting here and we are doing this direct action, um, but it also can be uh, maybe points of meditation as well. Yeah, I get that. That and to bring back um, Anita's quote about like having the re the responsibility or or the desire that needing feeling the need to like reconstruct these um, narratives, mm -hmm. like using what's available to us, using the the monuments that are around us or the documents that we have access to, mm -hmm. to reconstruct this, you know, history that was horrible um, and traumatic, but there are stories there uh, that need to be told. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, our role as is, is storytellers are, are to, to tell them, to try to tell them at least. Um, and to tell the stories of our of our own time. Definitely. Shout out to Anita. Anita's a good Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, yeah, totally. You know that that it, it kind of also makes me I've been we we talked about it a little bit. But I, I was thinking about like as we think about like using these resources that are here to be able to tell our stories and our narratives. It's it's, it's I and especially with working through like archive and things like it's really interesting for me to think about. I've been trying to 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 rationalize this or think about it recently. So hopefully I I can succinctly say my thoughts. But um, it's interesting because you you come across a lot of racist imagery, right? right. And, and and right and that sort of replaces the the representation or like self-representation of black people are like, you know, dignified representations, right? There's a lot right. of these like stereotypical images which are being occurred and still occur, right? right. Um, and I was thinking like, right, and then going back to this idea that Anita's talking about of like uh, using what is necessary to be able to tell our narratives and stories. And right. like, I had been like starting to think about this idea of like blackness um, as like this like metaphysical as well as like real intangible thing right that right. like and so i started to think about how blackness no matter when it is referenced it like kind of references like it's pure in like nature in this weird way all right this is follow me i don't know if this makes sense <laughs> <laughs> i'm here i'm ready like all this racist like imagery right that was right. Meant to like demean those and, like, postcards upgrade. yeah and supposed to demean and degrade me right right but but I think like the, the magical part of like blackness is that when I see those negative imagery, I want to dismantle white supremacy. And so <laughs> even when people try to use blackness as a form of degradation, it automatically supersedes, like it, it right. goes under all that stuff and does what its original thing is, which is meant to allow and um, a level of like freeness uh, right. for for at least me, and I think a lot of people, because I think, you know, I use blackness, but there's a whole lot of different sort of terminologies for it. And so I'm kind of interested, right? Like this right. sort of ability to use the archive, um, no matter what it is, uh, to like dismantle some of these things. Yeah, it becomes like a weapon for us. <laughs> exactly, right, yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't stop it. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. Do we open up for questions or do we have yeah I think uh we may have gone over time a little bit <laughs> sorry about that maybe once we start it we were just going to kind of go yeah we could have kept going <laughs> no I mean it's it, it's been fascinating listening and hearing the presentations thank you both so much and yes we do have time for a few questions and and definitely um probably more questions than we can get to immediately. But I wanna start with one from uh, Sarah Rogers. And she says, thank you for sharing your incredible work and everything that you're doing. And she was wondering if each of you could speak a bit about the role of photography as a media in your work, specifically its relationship 
you know, to history as archival documentation, but the history um, tied to objectifying and classifying the body. And you, you started to touch on that, you know, through different parts of it. But Sarah was curious about, you know, just that racist and sexist variations and forms and, or even colonialism. Just so again, we touched on a little bit, but maybe just even some personal thoughts on it. Um, yeah, so I guess on, on my part, um, we were just starting to get there in the end where it's like, okay, what, when Jay was talking about how these images, like uh, images from the archives in our hands um, are like a tool. I feel the same way about um, a, a camera or photography, whether it's my photography or someone else's photography, I'm going to use it for my liberation and the liberation of black folks. So, I mean, that's it, mm -hmm. period. What's, what's cool. A new history. Yeah. Right, right. Well, what's kind of cool about it though, like, all right, uh, Deborah Willis uh, has the, uh, reflections in in black right which is like a history of photography you, uh, of black photographers right and you right. read that book like it, it turns out like well a if, if, if no one remembers like right photography is is coming to its fruitions and its establishment right during like the civil war <laughs> right like during these moments and uh what, what you find is that, that people have always used photography as a tool of combating things, right? You can look at like, like Frederick Douglass, right? He was like creating all these images of himself as a way of combating, uh, you know, racist ideology. So when we think about like photography, it's always like there's, there's two possibilities of history that go back all the way to its founding days, right? We can look right. at it both as a tool of colonialism and, you know, suppression, but we can also see it as a tool of combating those things. Right. Um, I guess it's both simultaneously in a way, right? And I think that's probably like, I live in those uncomfortable spaces of, um, right? Of like seeing the dualities of how a thing can operate both to be against me and for me. Um, and it's just a balancing act, I guess. Yeah, there's this beautiful book uh, called Picturing Frederick Douglass. It's just, it's all about how he intentionally uses photography as a way to um, to combat and counter uh, racist stereotypes um, and assumptions that people make about Black life. Um, and W.E.B. W. Du Bois did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'm looking through the questions because you you both have so eloquently addressed uh, some of the comments here. Um, I have another, and questions. Um, I have another question about, uh, let's see, right here, but whether um, in some of your discussions and tying in, you know, your artwork together, but also do you compare and contrast your experiences growing up in different areas of the country and your experiences with racism? I mean, is it, is that kind of infuse um, from an anonymous attendee? Does that infuse some of your discussion as well about your work? Just those regional differences. I want to know what the regional differences are. I think they're curious too. <laughs> and that's, that in and of itself is a really powerful statement, right, Jay? Yeah, I mean, I mean like, <laughs> right, like. Can you expand, please? I think we always can think. I think when we think about regional differences in this terminology, we're talking like South versus North, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I think like white white Northerners love to love to be like those horrid Southern folks in their like racism. Um, but if you're not white, if you're black and you're dealing with racism, like the statue or the subversive comments, like different, but they lead to the same place. Yeah, I think I think a lot of us would argue we, we do the same thing here in Vermont. We like to wear a lot of badges, so to speak, of, about our history, but yet there's still a lot of history that we're discovering. And uh, it's good to have that discussion, you know? So it's, it's kind of everywhere, it's prevalent. And I'd like to follow up with another question as far as, you know, institutions, 
because here we are, we're BCA, we're a, a city institution. You both work for universities, their institutions. Um, I'm interested about, you know, sort of that ability to have uh, a frank dialogue about activism and your imagery. Like, you know, yes, they hire you and yes, we show your work, but do you feel that you can really like put the work out there or do you still have to kind of negotiate or navigate these institutions and in, in trying to share your work and tell your story? And you can be absolutely brutally honest because I, I like to hear it because I want to know what, what else we can do, you know, because sometimes we're not thinking about it and we can do better. Um. I will say this, I think that it's important to be very open um, and intentional. Uh, and when I say you, I mean me as an artist <laughs> about what my goals are um, and what my work is about and being able to communicate that clearly. So there are no, um, or at least so that I can minimize misunderstandings uh, mm -hmm. because it can be very um, easy um, and you can almost count on, uh, you know, t folks taking the, the sort of the, the quickest little like nugget and sort of like running with that and like, oh, this work is about blackness, no. <laughs> This work is my experience, my personal experience um, filtered through my personal lens. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I happen to be black. And that has plays a huge role in the type of work I make and the type of life I have. Mm -hmm. um, so creating a space so that I can communicate what I need to communicate, but also um, Having collaborators or, or folks that are um, that exhibit care um, and want my work to be shown um, the way it's meant to be shown and want it to be, um, you know, do do the work of, of protecting my narrative, helping me to do the work of protecting my narrative is important. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's very insightful. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think sometimes like the work and like the institution like dealing with that are like kind of different. I think sort of like what Becky's getting at is like I can make all this work that's about my experience, right? But that's about all these broader things. Um, but then you know, right now some institutions are just like look at some black work, right? Yeah. Like look at these these black artists, and yeah. that is that is change that. Um, my work can talk about, but that is the actual change of that perception or of that culture is also something that kind of operates outside of it. And so I think uh, when I think about things that institutions uh, can or possibly should do, right? I think a lot of it is um, a, a, a very painful reevaluation of what space you're taking up or, or giving uh, in your capability of inserting into this point of conversation that many people are trying to bring about, uh, your capability of entering into that conversation the way that you see possible or equitable. Um, I kind of bring up this uh, conversation that uh, came up in a faculty meeting once where uh, you know, a white colleague said, um, you know, we need more black faculty in here. Uh, how do we get more black people in here now? And I said, you should quit your job. Right, like if we wanna really be about the things we're talking about, then uh, are people really willing to give up that space, make that space and set aside uh, their own individual needs and maybe swap some spaces uh, with the, you know, the artist who is capable of doing those things or that curator or that whoever it might be that's able to do those things, but is, you know, pulling together the three or four time, you know, part-time jobs are you willing to swap out so that they can get the space to, to change these things if we're really gonna say we're about it? I think that's also like a question of intention. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. do, does the institution truly want to um, do the right thing or do they want to look like they're doing the right thing? 
right. for a moment of time. Right. That's that's always my concern. It's like, you know, is, is this a commitment? Do we have an ongoing commitment or is there an expiration date, which there shouldn't be? And it's something that I think is, you know, it's really powerful to reflect on what you're doing. And, and I really appreciate your time today. And I know I have several other questions, but realizing the time and everyone on the call, I would, I probably should wrap up. But, um, we will share these, uh, the rest of the comments and questions with you um, and to let everyone know too, that we're recording the session. And with that first, I have to say, thank you again, Jay and Becky, wonderful presentation, conversation, dialogue. And if you don't mind, I might say just a few more thank yous um, to the people who helped make this program happen. Um, first off, Colin Stores, our man behind the green curtain, our Zoom webinar expert. Thank you. And our communications team, John and Ted at BCA. Um, exhibitions like Unprecedented would not be possible without um, support from our funders, such as Mescoma Bank for our year of exhibitions, as well as the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the NEA and the Vermont Arts Council. And Unprecedented is presented as part of the 2020 vision reflecting on a world changing year. It's a statewide exhibition initiative from the Vermont Curators Group. And for those of you who haven't had a chance uh, to visit the BCA Center to see Becky's work in person, you still have a few more days. I really encourage you to check it out if you feel comfortable. We close on sap Saturday, January 30th, but if not, um, you can see the exhibition and Becky's work online with all of the interpretive materials in our 3D version on our BCA Home Studio page. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you again, Jay, Becky, wonderful. I wish we had more time or maybe you should have like an ongoing weekly series. It's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm here on the, I know you're sensing it. Thank you everyone for joining and have a good afternoon. Take care everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye. <laughs>